Hey y'all, welcome to the Q Spot Podcast with host Quabila Jones. Be prepared to laugh, cry, and take notes as we dive into each discussion. Stay tuned with special guest Leonardo Glover discussing mental health has no gender. Hey y'all, welcome to another edition of the Q Spot Podcast video series. My very special guest is Mr. Leo Glover. He is a licensed therapist in the city of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Um, but you serve other do you serve other counties? Uh, you yes, other I counties? do. I do serve other counties. Uh, right now, I'm in Craighead. Uh, my office is based in Craighead, but I also serve uh, Greene County, and I forgot what the county is with uh, Paragool. But um, I think. I think That's it's Green County. County. Yeah. So Green County, but really the whole state of Arkansas. I'm not just. Uh, mm-hmm. You don't limit yourself. <laughs> no. I, well, the fact that I'm a licensed counselor in the state of Arkansas, that enables me to see clients across the entire state. Now, when it comes to uh, going across state lines, every state has their own criteria or uh, requirements for a person in order to practice in their state, similar to like a doctor or something like that. Okay have to give a clearance you have to get clearance from each individual state so okay. right now i'm just licensed in the state of arkansas okay and just want to let everyone know that you have been in the mental health field for about 14 and a half years and now you're running your own private practice as oh, yeah. of three years ago and so it is called field life counseling llc so let's start um even oh, I didn't give the topic. The topic is mental health has no gender. We okay. hear so much about this and that help for women. Um, men often get left out of the conversation, even though there is a surge of conversations happening specifically for men. I think some men are still reluctant to get help, and oh, yeah. we see we see men acting out in a in a way. Um, that we know there's a deeper root to their behavior. And if they were only just, you know, be willing to open up or if the, their loved ones are willing to help them get the help they need, then they could be on their path to healing and living a more fulfilled life. <laughs> That's right. Well, All right. Uh, you, yeah, you say you hit it right on the head. Uh, traditionally, men, for the most part, have been reluctant to seek help. And a lot of that has to do with the traditional roles that men take on so far as, you know, being the rock and being uh, the provider for the family and things of that nature. And then you hear sometimes the uh, old sayings that, you know, men never let the men, uh, other people, men never let people see them cry and stuff of that nature. A lot of that also is pride, too. Uh, I can admit that a lot of us men are, are very prideful. And so in order to sign up for counseling or actually accept the idea of going to counseling is basically like just really saying that you need help. And a lot of men, for whatever reason, just aren't willing to, you know, depend on someone else and just admit, yeah, I need help with certain issues. So that's really the crux of the problem. So before you got into mental health, um, did you ever find yourself at a place where you were thinking, okay, I would never talk to a therapist. That is not for me. I'm a, I'm a man. And again, I know I'm a sociologist, so I know using those gender terms, um, you know, can be a little shaky. <laughs> like people have their own thoughts and feelings about yeah. what it means to be man, male, <laughs> and the gender roles and all of that jazz. But mm-hmm. Going back before you got into the field, you know, in your mind, what it meant to be a man? Did you ever see yourself here? Would you ever feel like I would never need therapy? I don't need help. I'm a, I'm good. Like I'm whatever. Uh, I would say yes and no. Okay, and that's a little cop out, but I'll just say it like this: just a little bit of self disclosure. When I was younger, I had my own incidences where I did some things that. I knew I wasn't raised to do and was uh, very uh, controversial to say the least. I was a little knucklehead at points in my life too. And so uh, it was a period in time where my parents took me to go get some counseling. Uh, And in talking with the lady, she was very nice. 
the, and we only met once, but she basically told my parents that I didn't need counseling, that I just was acting out, was just being a knucklehead. Okay. And so, uh, so that's the that's the no part. The yes part is that, you know, just growing up, like you say, as a man, you're you're taught certain things. And my dad, even though he had a PhD in psychology, he never really just, in my opinion, really talked to us about feelings and expressing how you feel and all this kind of stuff. He was more of a person that, you know, he just really growing up. I mean, he spent time with us and talked to us, but it was more about he would go to work and he would come home and he would do you know, his thing. And we were doing our things because we all had so many different activities and stuff like that. So it really was more just watching him that, you know, I never really, I can't remember just seeing him cry, maybe at a funeral or something like that. But, uh, you know, him and my mom, they didn't really just argue. I can only remember like one real argument between them two growing up. And maybe that had to do with the fact that he had a background in psychology as well. But uh, there was a part of me that was just like, you know, and it's not really like a blessing in my particular instance, where some other people, it's really like a curse because they don't seek help. But for me, it was a blessing just understanding uh, really, <laughs> you should, you can handle a lot of stuff. I'll just say it like that. And, you know, being learning how to process things on my own. I didn't really have an issue with that. Some people really do. And so, you know, it's really an individual thing. It's hard to, uh, we try to oftentimes put people in large groups and just group everybody together. But really when it comes to counseling and therapy or anything of that nature, it's more individualized. So for myself, it's a yes and a no. Okay. So, okay. so in your experience, um, in the different facilities uh, that you have worked at and now having your own practice, mm -hmm. what has been some of the, I don't want to say main because that's still categorized. That's compartmentalizing. Um, what well, what has been some of the top issues that you have encountered or men have expressed to you that they deal with that affect their everyday lives? Okay. Well, in my particular experience, number one thing would be anxiety issues. Just you know, a lot of worrying. Uh, based on, once again, we take, talk about traditional roles of being a provider and stuff like that. So, you know, you have a gentleman that maybe lost his job or uh, is in a bad relationship with his wife or something like that, and their family is breaking up. And so mo a lot of them have to uh, problems with anxiety. But then, you know, closely following that would be depression, uh, mm -hmm. several uh, individuals I work with who have uh, symptoms of PTSD based off, you know, coming up their childhood traumatic experiences or even as traumatic experiences as adults, uh, mm -hmm. substance abuse. So, you know, if I was just to say the top five, I would say anxiety, depression, PTSD, alcohol or substance abuse, and then ADHD would be my like, maybe the top five. Okay. And then from your experience, and of course, not disclosing any of your clients' personal information, of course not. Um, have you seen some improvement or willingness to um, accept the help that you are trying to give them? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is, I would say yes, and a lot of it is based on that initial uh, contact or interaction with the individual. Because what one thing I like to do on the first meeting is, you know, it's kind of set a foundation so far as, you know, why we're here uh, getting a consensus between myself and the client, as far as, you know, my goal is not really to change you, but to help you to change the things that you like to change about yourself and to promote you to grow and to, you know, for, reach that sense of fulfillment within your own individual life. And most people want to do that. I mean, when it comes down to it, if they're really a seeking counseling services, then they're at the point in their life where they want to change anyway. So I'm just there to facilitate that. And by me explaining that, you know, I'm just a facilitator to help, you know, with better decision making or learning certain skills, whether it be coping skills, relaxation skills, whatever it may be to deal with their uh, particular issues. Then 
that's going to be my role. Now, you do also have uh, a number of people who are court ordered. Oh. You know, now, some of those, <laughs> once mm -hmm. again, it, it can fall either way. A lot of them, you know, they don't want to get in any further court trouble in with the courts. So they, they're in counseling, but they really just like, okay, just doing what they can. They make it through. And then some really recognize, okay, man, I'm in big trouble. I done messed around and got into this legal trouble. So I do really need to change some of the things that I'm doing with my life. And then those are the ones that are, you know, a lot more uh, successful in their change. Through some of the conversations you've had, um, what has been the stigmas that has been expressed as to why they hadn't got help before? Um, I know, I, well, I can't say I know. I can imagine you meet some of your clients at a very, um, when they're in a very bad place. And we'll get into some of those behaviors, but what has been some of the stigmas that you've encountered um, or uncovered as to why they don't seek help before then? <laughs> Well, uh, I think it's, it could be a myriad things, but I would just say, uh, number one, it falls back onto that, you know, feeling of pride that I mentioned earlier, where they just don't want to be seen as being weak, you know, somebody that can't handle the, yeah. the issues that life brings at, you know, all of us. Uh, some people are able to handle them a little bit better. And everybody don't have the same problems. Like we all have problems from time to time, but yeah. everybody has different stuff. So that's one thing, just being... Uh, seen as being weak. And then the other big stigma, uh, and this really has to do with the African-American culture overall, you know, we put everything as you crazy, you know, so people don't want to be viewed as being crazy. Like a lot of people don't just understand that there are different, so many different things going on and really that traumatic events can alter a person's cognition where, you know, the way that they think and then which in turn affects the way that they feel and then in turn affects the way that they behave. And all of those things are interconnected. And so uh, overall, the idea that if anything is wrong and that you have help with handling certain issues that you're crazy or the other one is, of course, like I said earlier, that you're weak. So. Those would be like the two biggest stigma. I would also add in there, a lot of people think that it's uh, expensive and it can be expensive depending on who you're dealing with, but they don't understand that also, you know, there, besides insurance and self-pay, there are other uh, organizations and entities out here that are state funded where people who don't have any kind of insurance or any way of paying for uh their services, every county actually in the state of Arkansas has a organization that is uh, set forth to do that. So here we have, uh, Lord, I forgot the name right, just that quick. I think it's uh, CRDC, Crowley's Ridge okay. Development Center, does that. Also Mid-South Health Systems, that's the one I was looking for. Okay. Uh, both of those two entities are state funded in order to provide those type of services. Okay, so let's dive deeper into some behaviors. Um, I have a friend who works in the field. He's, he's not a licensed therapist, but he hosts seminars um, for men only, um, for men to have a safe space to come and talk and just address those issues. And there are therapists on site. And so some of the issues um, he sees are, like he said, substance abuse. And we often look at men Oh, they're just an alcoholic, their daddy was this, their family was this. And we don't understand why they are indulging so heavily in that behavior. Um, there are men who are abusers. I'm not going to say it's not at their own, because I'm not going to take the fault off of them. However, in some of those cases, there is a root to that issue. So can you dive a little deeper? Like what, since you're a man, <laughs> what goes into a man's mindset? Like when you're facing those hard life, oh God, those situations in life that I'm not saying you, but from your conversations and experience with the men you counsel. Okay, well, yeah. once again, it's, it's so many, everything is individual. So for every person, it's a different uh, answer to that question, but I would just, try to give a generalized answer and, you know, uh, hopefully that's answers your question. So 
when it all comes down to it, it really, a lot of it based off of either some kind of recent or past trauma uh, that they have experienced or some type of recent hardship or something like that. Like I say, uh, could be that they lost a job, they're the breadwinner, now the family is in uh, trouble of losing their home or something or having to uh, lose their mortgage. Or it could be something, you know, I have several uh, persons who were like involved with gangs and stuff when they were younger and they saw people get shot and killed and, you know, robbed and things of that nature or things have happened to them where they've been robbed at gunpoint and stuff like that. Uh, so many you know it could be issues with the with the wife or the significant other where you in a, been in a relationship and maybe you find out some infidelity type stuff or you know it's just not working out you guys about to get a divorce so any of those things can be triggers to cause us to either go into depression or anxiety or as i mentioned earlier with the ptsd you know you got guys that have been in the military or in the police or just like you say, you've seen something, been abused before. I had, uh, I got a couple of clients right now who, unfortunately, when they were younger, they were sexually abused. And over the years, they haven't had anybody to really, excuse me, uh, talk to. So they have internalized all of these different uh, negative feelings. And over time, this just festers and festers and festers. And now, boom, it's to the point where they really can't manage it or maintain it. Anxiety level is high. They're having uh, panic attacks, can't sleep, just all kind of stuff. And they, they get very paranoid as well uh, when thinking about, you know, what could happen to them. Because especially in a particular instance like that, when you're young, it's the people that you, you trust and you love that's actually harming you. And that really can damage a, a person's psyche you know you have these developmental stages and one of them is trust versus mistrust mm -hmm. and so if as, if you're young and you you get that stage kind of mixed up so far as who should i trust who can i not trust then unfortunately they they suffer a lifelong of uh not trusting anyone not trusting situations not even trusting themselves and it you know, it causes a lot of issues mm -hmm. From your experience, what happens when individuals go untreated for a lengthy amount of time and they reach the point of where they're about to detonate? Um, are they at the point of no return or is there still hope for those individuals? Oh, well, it's always hope for uh, change. I mean, I've seen people at the brink where they literally we're in a talk where they saying, OK, I want to commit suicide or I, mm -hmm. I got a plan. And we've been able to talk to them, de-escalate them and, you know, and start them going on down the right path. So it's never too late. Uh, but the other answer to that is, you know, when those kind of negative feelings sit in there so long and they fester and they build up, it's kind of like a volcano where you got so much pressure and eventually it's going to erupt. And we want to catch it before the eruption because most of the time when we get to the erupt point, it's going to be some physical violence involved uh, towards somebody else or maybe themselves. You know, that's the suicidal aspect or a person is going to turn to self-medicating to basically kind of numb themselves from the pain that they feel or have experienced in their life. Wow. Okay, um, so let's talk about the gender aspect. And again, what do you think is pushing the rise in um, well, encouraging men to get more help? Um, maybe you can give me some insight, maybe to data or when this turnaround really happened. We're now seeing more men in these in commercials and well, let's say in advertisements and different publications. Um, when it comes to getting mental health uh, help. Okay. Well, uh, I would say it's been a continual trend for maybe even the last 30 plus years. Oh, okay. But the, the reason that we're seeing so much of it now is just more information is going out there, you know? Uh, and I also think that it is uh, based on your culture or, you know, socioeconomic 
or your demographic background so far as you know your race uh, because uh, not to sound like a bigot or anything but white people white males been going to counseling for a long time it's just the African Americans and the Latino and the Asian populations who are just now really catching on uh, to seeking that kind of help. And so uh, some of it does have to do with the things I mentioned earlier about the stigma so far as, you know, uh, being seen as weak or not having finances or something of, uh, of that nature. But really the trend has been going on for a while the major shift that we see now is just more information. Like you say, you have more uh, commercials, you have radio commercials, you got TV commercials, you got videos, you got uh, superstar athletes or um, entertainers talking about how they was in therapy. You even have like vid uh, talk shows, what is it, Dr. Oz and things of that nature, which opens up the, the mind and, and the culture in general to a point where it's more willing to accept that people do, there are people out here that need help and people are, you know, willing to go ahead and just reach out that hand. All right. Now for those of us um, who are the loved ones of, you know, individuals that are suffering sometimes silently, what are some signs and symptoms we need to be on the lookout for to recognize that someone really needs some help? Okay. <laughs> or are there individual signs? Yeah, well, there's so many different ones because each and every uh, disorder, if you would, has their own particular behaviors that are assigned to it, okay, and a certain criteria which identifies that certain disorder. But okay. in general, you know, what you really want to be doing is looking for anything that you would consider a, a, a drastic change in a person's behavior or demeanor, you know. If, if you know a person is normally upbeat and funny going and fun going and lively, and then, you know, you notice for like the next two, three weeks that they really are lethargic and they're not saying too much and they, you know, you're noticing that big change in their personality, then that's a pretty good indicator that something is going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing with, you know, if you're noticing that they are starting to hang out with people that they normally didn't hang out with or go places that they normally wouldn't go, like to bars and stuff yeah. like that. Or, you know, if they stay, yeah. if you're like a kid, they're staying yeah. out late or something. I'm sorry, y'all, my son's in the background. <laughs> can can y'all hear him? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. okay. It's life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> those are the main things that you just, I would try to, if you notice any major changes in their behavior, let's look at that. And then also, you know, like you say, uh, groups of people that they're hanging around, if those seem to change just drastically from what they normally would do, then that was, those are some pretty good indicators. Uh, a lot of uh, isolation and secrecy as well could be an indicator that something uh, is going on. You know, people tend to try to get by themselves when they're either depressed or something like that. Uh, like I say, being in secret. So when it comes to substance abuse, you know, generally people don't just come out and be full-blown alcoholics or, you know, uh, meth addicts or whatever. They're doing stuff in secret. They're gone, you know, for hours at a time or whatever. You're like, where you been? And then they ain't really got no explanation, stuff like that, you know. So those are just a few of them. Let me ask you this. First, this question. Do you counsel children under the age of 18? Yes. Okay. So I, have, I have kids uh, as young as four years old on my caseload. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Second, second question. If a child has experienced serious trauma, divorce, death of a parent, um, abuse of some kind, um, whatever, should the family, should their family or caretakers immediately put them in some type of counseling therapy slash therapy to, okay. Okay, well, go ahead and finish the question. Well, basically to maybe ensure that some behaviors don't develop, some negative behaviors, or should they, I guess, be proactive, I guess, if that's the term to use. Well, there's nothing wrong with being proactive, but still my answer to that question would be no, 
Uh, yeah. Therapy to me is just kind of like a doctor uh, where we're a specialized group that are here for specialized problems. So say for instance, just because your child has a little runny nose, you're not gonna run them to the PCP every time, right? That's something yeah. that most of the time the, the mama can handle. We're gonna give you some over-the-counter cough syrup or whatever, and you can be all right in a day or two. Well, it's just the same thing with therapy. It depends on what's happening. Even though you did identify some traumatic things, if the parents and the family are able to pull together and to discuss the issues with the young child and they are able to uh, become accepting of it and, you know, uh, develop their own coping skills, then, hey, what's the need of therapy? Uh, and some families are able to do that. Other families, like you say, they sweep problems under the rug. They let things foster or they're not even paying attention to their child to the point that they're not understanding that, OK, we went through this divorce, but we're not looking at how it's affecting little Johnny or little Susie or, you know, Malik or whoever. And so it's just like, in the end, if the family can pull together and, and deal with it themselves, then that's great. But it's in those instances when they can't do that. And like you said, the uh, they don't know what to do. Then, yeah, let's, let's seek therapy. Let's seek counseling. Uh, and that way we know that we can get some professional help. Okay. Now, what advice would you give for women? Because, you know, we women, we have our way, we have our attitudes. <laughs> and so our significant other spouse, whatever, brother, cousin, whoever has expressed they need help. They have issues and they don't like our behavior towards them. But women, you're like, OK, whatever. Like, so what advice would you give to women? To know that our man's life, when he has expressed, I need help, or I don't like what you're doing, or I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, the first answer to that is, you know, yeah. you want to treat him the way you want him to treat you. So far as okay, let's respect what he's saying and respect his feelings, and then let's you know try to be supportive. That especially if you're in some type of like you say a marriage or a relationship, then that should be what you're willing to do. The other thing I would say is just just don't downplay it. You know, once again, in, in a society in America, especially, you know, the attitude toward men is, you know, you, you should be tough. You shouldn't be around here crying, crying or be emotional or anything of that nature. It's more like suck it up. And so that's the wrong approach to take, uh, I would say, for our women just to be, you know, supportive. And be inquisitive as well. I mean, there's nothing wrong with you asking further questions to kind of get a better idea if this is something that, hey, maybe you guys can work out together. Or once again, does he need to seek professional help? Okay. All righty. And then as far as, you know, parents or caregivers of children, uh, again, I know that mental health issues exhibit themselves in a variety of forms. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let me, before I get to that question, kind of give us a differentiate mental health versus I'm just having a bad day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's kind of difficult, but not really. Okay, so let me just start with this without being too technical. In the counseling arena, we'll say, in, okay. our, in our world, we have what is known as the DSM-4, which stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, okay? And basically, it's a book with about 1,500 pages that identifies every each and every disorder that you can ever think about, okay? And that, that is created by what is known as the American Psychiatric Association, okay? okay? And each disorder has their own criteria. So based on that, when you say, you know, everybody's just having a bad day, okay? If it's a bad day, then tomorrow or the next day, you should be back to yourself. It's when we see uh, certain behaviors or feelings or things of that nature continue for a period of time, you know, uh, just say, for instance, like depression. Most people, everybody gets sad from time to time. Some people sad, you know, excuse me, a couple of hours. Some people, maybe a day or two. Maybe even a week. Now, we're not talking about grieving because when you lose a family member or a significant other, the grieving process is a little bit different than, 
you know, being just sad or having the blues. Okay. But in order to be recognized as clinical depression, that uh, symptom or those type of behaviors need to last a minimum of two weeks. And so okay. generally, if you're just having a bad day, it's not going to take you two weeks to get over that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even if it's a really rough relationship, you know, and you broke up, it generally don't take you two weeks. You might think about it, but like after the first couple of days, you, yeah. you know, you might be crying and sad, but then after that, you're going to get your swag back. Yeah. So, uh, but there also is a certain criteria. Now I'll just say this uh, within the DSM four, that's the book. Remember okay. uh, it's called something that's called an adjustment disorder. And which is basically saying something recent has changed in our life that has caused us uh, emotional distress and is it's temporary, it's short lived, but is significant nonetheless. Now, even with that type of uh, situation, what is known as an adjustment disorder, that distress generally lasts at least six weeks or more. Okay. Okay, so that's really the main difference is just the length of time that things happen. Because generally when somebody has what is known as a uh, disorder, according to the American Psychiatric Association, it's something that lasts for quite a while. It's not something that, you know, here we are on a, two, on a Monday and I'm feeling just terrible down. I don't want to do anything. And then Wednesday, I'm back up and I'm gleeful. I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, it's not like that. So okay. that's the major difference. From some of the clients that you have encountered, do you feel from your professional observation, I want to say opinion, observation, do you feel that some people give in to their negative feelings too much and they want to be classified as having a mental disorder or they just... Huh? Well, I get what I get. What you're saying uh, is is really not funny because when you see somebody that's, that's like that, it, it kind of like it, for me personally, it just kind of make me a little upset. Like, man, what you doing? You know. But yes, there are a lot of people out there that want to assume what is known as the sick role, so then somebody can be a caregiver for them. Now, that can either be a learned thing, uh, where so far as you know, all of their life they might have had a parent or a guardian or a caregiver that constantly put them into that role. So that's where they're comfortable at, you know. Uh, also, it can be a learned behavior so far as, you know, maybe when you were young, you were sickly in some kind of way or another, and you got a lot of attention. And so now you, you, you're craving that type of attention. And now that even though the issue is over with and you're perfectly fine, the fact is you, you crave that type of attention. So you continuously seek that. And that's what is known as, you know, taking on the sick role. Okay. Okay. All right. So I want to swing it back around, you know, to focus on men. And so what advice would you give to men um, that feel like, okay, something is happening. I don't know what life is happening. You know, we're moving into the holiday season and it affects people in different ways. Um, the weather affects people in different ways. And so what is some advice you would give to men? Because, you know, we talk about ladies all the time. So let's give some love to the men. Well, uh, first thing I would say is just be realistic with yourself. I mean, you under, you know whether or not you uh, are having certain type of negative feelings. And if you're, if you're down in the dumps or if something is not, if you're not being your normal self. OK, and just briefly, I want to touch on the fact that, as you said, there is such a thing as seasonal depression. And yeah. so it basically, you know, people uh, behaviors and mental state changes with the, with the literal seasons. OK, that is a real phenomenon. But for the most part, people have triggering events. OK, so a triggering event is like we say something traumatic has happened or something and our life has happened that causes us to change the way that we think and change our behaviors. 95% of it is, well, I won't say 95, that's a bogus number. I'll just say a large percentage of it is 
uh, caused by a triggering event, but there are some people out here who have chemical imbalances. And so I talked about the seasonal depression earlier. Uh, people like that, they actually have chemical imbalances. So it's no triggering event. Like you say, they don't know what's going on. It just happens. Okay. And for individuals like that, uh, we will prescribe of course, some kind of medication uh, regimen therapy as well as you know mental health where we're talking it out and developing coping skills overall i just uh, encourage men to like I say be realistic with themselves if you know you have some type of issue don't be scared to reach out uh as i mentioned earlier too try to talk with your support group first if you have a support group you know talk to the people who support you who are around you and who you trust and can depend on and see if you guys are able to work it out internally amongst yourselves and then if you see that it's something that you're going to need some outside help with then you know be be open to actually uh seeking a therapist but uh we therapists you know we we like having new clients but we don't want we don't like wasting our time because there are a lot of people that's out there that really need help mm -hmm. and so you know we kind of talked about people that like being in the sick role and stuff you know we don't really want those guys <laughs> we don't want or women or anybody we don't want we want people that actually need our services who need our help so that we can help better the community we don't want to waste our time and energy and your insurance dollars you know just uh chasing chasing our tail uh so okay. to speak yeah well, we're gonna do an unshameless plug here for your business so go okay. ahead and give me uh the phone number you would like people to reach you at and the email so start with the phone number okay so the phone number to fulfill life counseling llc is nine area code nine zero one five zero one Six zero nine one. Okay. And okay. then email. My email address is pretty lengthy, but okay. it's fulfill life counseling, all one word. So that's F U L F I L L E D C O U N S E L I N G. No, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not life. I'm sorry. Fulfill life, L I F E, then C O U. S E L I N G at email is an elephant dot com. So once again, that's fulfill life counseling at email dot com. And you definitely can uh, contact me there, leave me a message or anything like that. Even if you just have a question about whether or not you uh, probably need therapy services or get some kind of consultation, then we'll get it. Yeah, what you got on the screen, that's it right there. You got it, sis. <laughs> yeah. All right. Please reach out uh, to Mr. Leo. Get the help you need. Ladies, I'm going to talk to y'all. Us. Listen to you, man. Your, your, boy, your brother, your daddy, whoever. Let them come to you. Hold space for them to open up to you. And then God can be the one who got you the help they need. When the family is whole, like you know, mama happy, daddy happy, everybody's happy. You know? That's right. Um, one thing we didn't touch on, I want to get to real quick. When a man is having issues in his own life, mental, real mental health issues, and say he's married, and the marriage may have started out really great, but now there's this disconnect. Um, are there ways to get it back, get the marriage back on track? And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm sure most people have heard of marital counseling. Uh, and so you have different forms of marital counseling i would i like to see because i do marital counseling myself but i personally like to see people do the premarital counseling first so before you get married let's do the counseling and so we can talk about issues and things of that nature to kind of smooth some of those things out but we also know that life throws us curveballs from time to time and things may come up and later on down the line we may need counseling so yes there is marital counseling out there what they call relationship counseling or couples counseling that's all the same thing and where people are willing to say all right we need some help here uh and we, they're reaching out to a professional they typically would go with some type of curriculum where they're are going towards a particular goal and let me just say this in general uh everybody who participates in therapy has what's called a treatment plan 
uh, where, you know, you and the therapist kind of talk about where your issues may lie and where you want to be at the end of the road. Because therapy is not supposed to be lifelong. It's supposed to be, you know, from one point to another to help you to reach a certain level. And then you're able to pick it up by yourself and, you know, move on. All right, so you've been in this thing for quite a while. Do you ever see yourself retiring? Uh, say again, do I ever see myself what? Retiring. Oh, yeah, well, we all, we all want to retire early, but I will say this, uh, and I tell people this all the time. Actually, it's funny, my wife, well, we're not going out right now because of Corona, but uh, when I was going out and visiting with my clients every day, she, you know, I come home and she would ask me, how's my day? And it's funny because I'm almost like a broken record. Every time I'd be like, it was awesome. And I don't say that just to kind of like downplay what she's asking me, but literally I feel that way based on the fact that I just really believe that I'm fulfilling my purpose. Uh, that God has given me so far as just, I've always been a person who's wanted to help people ever since I was a little kid. And so uh, with the uh, environment that I grew up in, I'm from a small town known as Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Has a really crime, high crime rate. And you know, the, the area that I grew up in, uh, there were a lot of gangs and stuff like that. And so all of that being said, you know, I'm going to retire one day, but even if I do retire, once I get rich, I still think I'm going to be helping people out <laughs> one way or another. Uh, maybe not be professionally for serve for a fee, maybe doing some pro bono work with, you know, some organization or something of that nature. But, you know, this is my calling. So I'm going to be doing this to the day I die. I got a feeling. All right. I got two more questions for you. Okay. One, when you go out, when you were going out, do you feel that people um, like your circle, um, they were reluctant to open up about things because you are a counselor? Like they were like, <laughs> they don't, they don't want to be analyzed. <laughs> no, well, that, I never was that kind of person either that I just, you know, voluntarily try to analyze you. You know, uh, like you say, a lot of people not just looking for a counselor. Okay. But uh, surprisingly, it's the opposite of what you're saying. People know that what I do, so they come to me with their problems. Okay. It's like, you know, uh, you know, it's off the record. So, like, let me holler at you over here right quick, bro. I got this, this, this going on. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, and we talk about stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's more the opposite. They come to me more than so than they going away. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, the other question, because this topic is about um, – Mental health has no gender. Uh, men face men face issues too. Why do you feel that representation matters? We talk about representation, you know, when it comes to minorities and women um, occupying certain spaces in society. But why do you feel that representation really matters? Having more men, especially in this field, in the mental health field. Okay, are you saying as clients or as the professional as the therapist yeah oh, okay well definitely uh people speak with those with whom they feel they have the most in common with or they are more comfortable with and mm -hmm. so even with my work as a uh, in other agencies you would have people that come in with their referrals and they would literally request you know being able to talk to a male some would even specify as much as being a willing, uh, wanting only to talk to a black male. Okay. And so, you know, people already have perceptions in their mind about uh, who they would, they're comfortable with and what they would like to divulge with certain people and who are able to understand them. And some of that is um, credible, just seeing that, you know, if I'm from the same background and same culture, there's certain things I'm probably going to understand, not 100%, but probably going to understand that somebody else would not and vice versa that they can play for me and against me so when it comes to you know the need for males in the field as we mentioned earlier there is an influx of uh, males that are also looking for therapy services so for us to be there and ready and present to provide them with the help and provide them with a uh, comfortable uh, environment which they will be willing to divulge about themselves and their issues is, is very important. 
All righty. Well, I can't thank you enough for giving me your time today and um, get to chime in. We got a little chime in from your beautiful son. Uh, <laughs> I like that, man. He is a character. Like so um, in about, I guess, a minute or two, any final words of encouragement? Well, I just uh, want everybody to be encouraged. And today we know a lot is going on in this world uh, and in the United States in regard to uh, the coronavirus, the election, and just, it seems as though life in general, people, there's a disregard for life. We got a lot of crime and all types of things. I just want people to be encouraged about their, them, themselves and their lives and just understanding that, you know, everyone is created with a purpose and for us to try to seek that purpose uh, through which God created us with, you know, for my people who are atheists or whatever, you got a purpose too. You might not believe in God, but it's find your purpose as well. Okay. And yeah, just, just be encouraged y'all. Uh, I know things seem rough, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There's gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, and what other acronym or, uh, I won't say acronym <laughs> saying you want to use. Yeah. A little saying you want to use, but just be encouraged and also know that there are people out here who are willing to help and assist you with, with your issues or with problems, uh, just have the courage to go ahead and step out and to uh, ask for help. All right. Well, thank you, and okay. thank you, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the King Spot Podcast. Um, please follow, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz on all the social media platforms and uh, YouTube. And so be on the lookout for these videos. Um, I like to post on Instagram and Facebook, so stay tuned. And so join the crew so you don't miss a beat. And as always, be sure to kiss the show. Thank you for watching the Q Spot Podcast Video Edition. Don't forget to join the Q Crew so you don't miss a beat. Follow, like, share, and subscribe to all of my social media platforms and the major podcast platforms. And as always, pink sugar kisses. Mwah.